excited you've joined us this Sunday. We're gonna praise our Father. So let's lift our voices as we sing this out. Come on. Oh, don't lose heart, oh my soul, oh my soul. Don't give up, there is hope, there is always hope. Come on, he's the Prince of Peace, we sing out. And there is peace in the storm. Just one 
Praise the 
worship all the glory and all the praise in this place. It's His holy name we said amen. Amen, church. You guys can go and have a seat. My name is Amy. Whether you're on campus or online, welcome to Rock Point. We're so glad you're here. We encourage you to take out your mobile device and go to rockpoint.io, where you can follow along with the sermon, take notes, take your next step, and more. If you're a guest and joining us on campus today, we have a gift for you and can't wait to meet you at New Here, Start Here on the patio. If you're joining us online today, connect with us under the New Here, Start Here tab at rockpoint.io. Lighthouse Summit is a half-day conference designed to raise awareness and support for various nonprofit organizations dedicated to the healing process of victims of human trafficking. Join us for this amazing event Sunday, July 18th from 3 to 7 p.m. as we focus on the ways God can use the local church's influence to partner with nonprofit organizations. Head to lighthousesummit.org to register now. Are you new to Rock Point? We would love to see you at our next Newcomers Dinner on Saturday, July 24th at 6.30 p.m. This is a great opportunity to make new friends and discover all the ways you can get plugged into the community. There will be free dinner and fun games and your kids can join too. There are dozens of opportunities for you to use your unique gifts on Team Rock Point. If you're ready to see what God can do through you but don't know where to start, check out our sneak peek volunteer tour on Saturday, July 31st. We'll introduce you to the various ministry areas and the volunteer opportunities available. Our mission here at Rock Point is to point people to Jesus by loving them like Jesus. Thank you for your faithful giving. While we don't receive the offering in service, you can give online at rockpoint.io under the Give tab to set up your recurring financial gift. Or we have offering boxes near the exits in the worship center and the lobby. Thank you for your generosity. While you're here with us today on campus or online, let us know if we can help you in any way. Be sure to connect with us on rockpoint.io and follow us on social media to stay up to date with what's happening here at Rock Point. The shadows cast against the wall from the flickering candles created a somber environment. But there was much more than just the candles that created this ambiance in the room. The last few days had been much like that. There were 13 men. They were sitting around this table with these candles. And one of them perhaps was thinking back three or four years to this moment that would turn his life upside down. Three or four years earlier when he had been fishing on the Sea of Galilee with his dad and his brother and they came to shore and this, this well-known rabbi, Yeshua, Jesus, approached them and said, come and follow me. And in that moment, this man named Peter and his brother dropped everything and they began to follow this Jesus and oh, the next three or four years of their life, the things that they would witness, the things that they would hear, the miracles that they would see. But in the last few days, Jesus had been acting very serious and very somber, and, and now on this, on this night, the, the last night, the, they're celebrating the Passover, and there's these flickering lights, and Jesus has been talking about these crazy things like going up to Jerusalem and, and dying, and Peter and the other disciples are like, what are you talking about? You've proven you're the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for. You're going to set up your kingdom. You're going to overthrow the, the tyranny of the Roman government. But then on this night, as they're sitting in this somber room with these flickering candles, Jesus says some things that will completely transform the lives of Peter and the other men in that room. At one point, Jesus is, is praying out loud to his father. And he says, I, I pray, Father, that they would be one as we are one so that the world will know. And, and moments later, he'll look at these men and he'll say, you know how the world are going to know who, that you follow me? You know how the world is going to know who my followers are? By your love. What? Not by your theology? Not by your, your words or your rhetoric or your, or your messages? Not by your power, not by your purity or your holiness. They're going to know your mind by your love. This was, 
This is, this is upside down, backwards, inside out. This is counterintuitive. This is countercultural. In fact, it would revolutionize Peter's life to the point that he eventually would understand this truth. It's the big idea for this weekend, this truth that people care more about what comes out of our lives than what comes out of our mouths. You know that's true, right? People care more about what comes out of our life than what comes out of our mouth. And Peter began to understand that. If you have your Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 3, we're in week 6 of this series that we've been doing here at Rock Point called Refiner's Fire. And we're looking at this letter that Peter wrote about 30 years after the events of that night when Jesus said, I pray that they would be one as we are one, Father, so that the world will know. How is the world going to know who the followers of Jesus are? By their love. 30 years later, Peter will sit down and he'll write this letter. We call it 1 Peter it's near the end of the Bible there, and, and he writes this letter to these Jesus followers scattered throughout the Roman Empire who are under intense persecution, and he's wanting to encourage them, and he's wanting to tell them, how do we live out this Christian faith in this world under persecution in difficult times? But what we're going to see in 1 Peter chapter 3 today will make no sense to us if we don't understand the context. In fact, not only will it not make sense to us, you'll be incredibly frustrated if you try to live out what we're going to look at in 1 Peter chapter 3, and you don't understand the context behind it. I'm going to explain the context in a moment. Let me, let me just pause and pray for us. God, uh, we need you. Once again, I beg you, I plead with you, Spirit of God, if you would open our hearts and minds to get this, because if these are just words we hear and another message we hear, and, and your power isn't behind it, God, we leave here and we just, we just go through another week. And so God, we ask that you would change us, move us, motivate us, right now. We love you, Jesus, and all God's people said. Amen. So uh, I'm going to drop a truth here that maybe some of you aren't aware of. If you're a note taker, you're going to want to write this down. This is very important. Maybe some of you have never heard this before. You'll see a picture on the screen. I just want you to know that that's not how things work. Okay. <laughs> all right. Some of you, this is news to you. Wait, I thought, the, I thought the world revolved around me. I'm being facetious, right? Because we all know this. Even if you're young and you're sitting in here, you've heard your mom or dad or grandparents or a teacher or a coach, somewhere along the line, someone said these words to you. Hey, the world doesn't revolve around you. The problem is, is that most of humans throughout most of human history and all of us in here and all of you watching online, at times we act like the world revolves around us, don't we? We try to live. We intellectually understand that it doesn't, but we start trying to live that way and it causes havoc in our relationships, in our marriages, in our families, in our friendships, in our workplaces, when we live like the world revolves around us. See, the context that we're going to look at today, 1 Peter chapter 3, the message, he's going to talk about unity. He's going to talk about what he heard Jesus say 30 years before he wrote these words, when Jesus said, I pray that they would be one as we are one so that the world will know. How will the world know who the followers of Jesus are? By our love. So he's going to talk about, well, how do we live this out? But if we don't understand the context, it's going to be frustrating to us. See, the context is a chapter before in 1 Peter chapter 2. If you were here a couple of weeks ago when I preached, I preached about identity. Because in chapter 2, Peter's reminding us who we are. He's saying, you, you are children of God. You are created in the image of God. You are a royal priesthood. You are the possessions of God. Which reminds us that this picture isn't true. The world actually doesn't revolve around us. The world and history and the story revolves around who? God, Jesus. In fact, it's not just 1 Peter that that's the context. It's this whole book, this whole narrative. Go to the very beginning, Genesis 1 verse 1, the very beginning of the story. It says, in the beginning, God. It doesn't say in the beginning, Patrick. It doesn't say in the beginning, your name. In the beginning, God. The story started with God. Go to the end of the story, Revelation, the very end, where we see into the future, and we see when Jesus comes back and says every tribe and every nation, every knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Not that I am, not that you are. So who's the center of the story? Jesus, God. It, it, it's about him. One, one writer put it this way. He said it's a, it's a theo narrative, theo God, Versus an ego narrative. Ego meaning ego, myself. And the danger is, is when we make the story ego about me and the story not about God, we start living like we're the center of the universe and oh man, that creates problems. And we know that because we see it all over the place. Now, 
I recognize when I said that we're going to talk about unity today that some of you are going, oh, man, I'm going to get on social media. Don't. Don't. Because we need to hear this. We, we recognize this is a struggle for all of us. I, I get it. How, how many married people in here go, oh, yeah, it just happens naturally that we get along? <laughs> no, no one. How many families go, oh, yeah, we just get along naturally all the time, never have any issues. Siblings get along perfectly. Doesn't happen, right? And if you think that the getting along just happens, get on social media later today and watch. Just listen to what people are saying and how they re respond and talk to each other. Unity is something that doesn't happen. Harmony doesn't happen naturally. Loving each other doesn't happen naturally. And remember, when Peter sat in that room with those flickering candles and he heard Jesus say, I pray that they would be one as we are one so that the world will know. How is the world going to know the followers of Jesus? By their love. So Peter is going to sit down and he's going to say, okay, I have to tell you about how to love well because that's this kingdom that we're talking about. The kingdom of God, it's about love. That, that's, the, that's how people are going to know. Unlike any other kingdom, it's this upside down, backwards, inside out kingdom. It's this countercultural, counterintuitive kingdom. Unlike any other kingdom. So, so let me show you what I mean. So, so Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, he sits down and he's going to start writing about how, how do we be unified? How do we get along? How do we love each other? So he writes this, 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Now stop right there. Because I imagine maybe, maybe at this point, Peter set his quill down or whatever he wrote with 2,000 years ago. He's got his parchment spread out. He's writing on it. And maybe at this moment, he just set his quill down after he wrote those words. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. And maybe he put his head in his hands and he remembered those words of Jesus 30-some years before. And I pray that you would be one as we are one so that the world will know. And the world's going to know you're my followers by your love. Not by your power, not by your, your theology, not by your rhetoric, not by your, 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 your purity, not by your holiness, but by your love. So maybe at this moment that, that Peter wrote that, he just thought about those words of Jesus. And so now what he's going to do is in the next two verses, he's going to explain how we do that. How do we live out this unity? How do we live in harmony? How do we love each other well? And so I'm going to say, and if you're note takers, you want to write down exactly these words, because I, I chose these words carefully. He's going to give us six ingredients to combat conflict. He's going to give us six ingredients to combat conflict. I chose those words for three reasons. Six ingredients to combat conflict. I chose those words, number one, because it doesn't happen naturally. It's like I just said. How many marriages in here, you're like, oh, yeah, we just get along all the time. It's easy. How many families? None of us. It's, it, it takes work. Combat. You have to fight against conflict. Six ingredients to combat conflict. The second reason I chose those words like that is it's not an option for us. It's not, a, it's not, it's not whether you as a follower of Jesus, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus and here watching online, you, you don't get to say, you know, I like the first three, last three I don't really like. I think I'll do the first three and ignore the last three. Peter's saying, no, you don't get that option. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus, this is what you need to live. This is, you need to have these in your life. And the other reason I chose those words, six ingredients to combat conflict, is because these synergize together. These six things go together. It's, it's a little bit like a recipe. You know how when you go home, and I know everybody in here has experienced this at some point, when you walk in a door and someone's just made some brownies, remember that smell, right? You can smell it right now, can't you? Just, oh, like you open the door and... and uh, Oh, I can smell them now. We all want brownies now, don't we? But, but brownies, that whatever made those brownies, all those ingredients, by themselves, those ingredients aren't that great. Take a teaspoon of salt and throw it in your mouth. Blech. Take a couple of cups of flour and just start eating that. Blech. Take cocoa. It's bitter, but, but when you put all the ingredients together, oh. So, so Peter is saying these six things that he's about to list. How do we live out this love? How do we live in unity and harmony with one another, which is so important? Because remember, how do people know we're Jesus followers? By our love. Why? Because people care more what comes out of our life than what comes out of our mouth. People care, care more about what comes out of our life than what comes out of our mouth. So let's look at these six ingredients. The, the first one we see is to be sympathetic. To be sympathetic. It, it comes from the very next phrase in verse 8. So keep reading verse 8. It says, finally, all of you should be of one mind. And remember, perhaps, at this point, Peter put down his quill and paused. And he remembered Jesus' words. 
I pray that you would be one as my father and I are one so that the world will know and the world will know you're my followers by your love. Why? Because people care more about what comes out of your life than what comes out of your mouth. And so then he starts listing these things and the first one is to be sympathetic, to, to, to have empathy. Empathy and, and being sympathetic just simply means that we, we feel what other people feel. And so we, we, we grieve when someone's grieving. We rejoice when someone's rejoicing. We celebrate when someone's celebrating. It's to be empathetic. It's to, to feel with them. Now, I used to work with a guy who was not very empathetic at all, and he would always say it this way. He'd say, it's not that I don't know what you're feeling. It's just that I don't care. <laughs> wow, I guess you're honest. But here's what's interesting about it. Personality studies have proven this now. Some of you in here, some of you watching online, are just naturally empathetic. When you were little children, you just, you're, if your parents told us stories about you, they'd be like, oh yeah, they're just naturally very an empathetic person. Some of you others in here, empathy is a little harder for you. It doesn't come naturally. You're like, I don't, I don't even care sometimes. With some, I don't even know what people are feeling sometimes in the room. Here's what's interesting. Peter doesn't say, if you're naturally good at sympathy, then be sympathetic. If you're not naturally good at this, don't worry about it. He doesn't say that. So those of us in this room that this is a little more difficult for us, it doesn't come naturally for us, it's still not an option for us. Peter's saying, if, if you want the world to recognize us by our love, then, then you need to be sympathetic. You need to be empathetic. Look at the second ingredient that he lists here. The second one is to be loyal. Six ingredients to combat conflict, be sympathetic, be loyal. This comes from, keep reading verse 8. He goes on in verse 8, and he says, love each other as brothers and sisters. And you may go, well, where did you get the phrase be loyal from loving each other as brothers and sisters? We get to do another little language study today. Woo! Yeah, I know it. I know you were coming to church today driving, going, I hope we get to do a language study again. And yes, we do. This phrase, love uh, as brothers and sisters, or be unified as brothers and sisters, is used 250 times in the New Testament. 250 times. Now, it was written 2,000 years ago in Greek, and so a, little, a literal, if they literally translated it into English, it would say, love each other as you're from the same womb. Love each other as you're from the same womb. That's a literal translation. James talks about it, Peter talks about it here, Paul talks about it, John talks about it, these guys that wrote the New Testament 250 times. Well, why did they use that phrase? We gotta back up to another story of Jesus to understand it. It's found in John chapter three. It's a story where this guy named Nicodemus, I'm gonna call him Nick, when Nick shows up to talk to Jesus. Now, Nick, if you know his background, he was a very powerful man, wealthy man, intellectual man. He was part of the Sanhedrin. That would kind of be like saying, uh, in America, it'd be like saying that he was part of the Supreme Court, one of the most powerful, wealthy, intellectual, influential people in Israel in those days. He knew that culturally it would get him in trouble if he was caught talking to Jesus at this point in Jesus' ministry. So he shows up at night, late at night. So let me, let me just kind of put it in a modern day story so you can understand. Nick is so powerful that he has his own driver. Most of us in here, we don't have our own driver. We don't pick up the phone, hey driver, pull up in front of the house. Nick had his own driver. And this Suburban with darkened windows, because he's so important, he doesn't want anybody to even see that he's in the Suburban. The Suburban with darkened windows pulls up, Nick goes and gets in it. He tells him the address that he hears Jesus is at. Goes to the address, but Nick says, don't oh, go down two more blocks, don't park in front of Jesus' house. So he pulls down two more blocks, not at six or seven o'clock at night, at midnight, when most everybody's in bed. And then he tells his driver, is anybody looking? So his driver's looking up in the, in the, in the, in the windows, looking down the streets, I don't see anybody. So Nick gets out. He walks down the shadows of the sidewalk, knocks on the door. Jesus answers the door. Nick's like, hey, I want to talk to you, but I can't talk out here. I got to come inside. That, that's how John 3 starts. So, so Nick walks in and he says, Jesus, I've seen and heard some things about you. You must be from God. Are you the Messiah? Are you the one that we've been waiting for? Because Nick's a devout Jew. Are you the one we've been waiting for? And then Jesus says something that, that throws this intellectual, wealthy, powerful, brilliant man. He says, yeah, I, I'm the one. But listen, Nick, if you want to get into my kingdom, the kingdom that you've been waiting for, you have to be born again. Now, if you grew up in church, that's a churchy phrase now. We all know that. If you grew up in church, you're like, oh, yeah, be born again. You know how weird that sounds? And, and here's this intellectual man who's standing there going, wait, um, 
I don't think that's possible. You know, like for me personally, I'm five feet nine, all of five feet nine inches tall. My mom's five feet tall. This isn't going to work. I, I, and Nick even says that if you read John 3, what, how, do I go back in my mother's womb? What, that doesn't make sense. How can this work? And Jesus says, oh, Nick, you're, you're missing it. There's two births. You have a physical birth. We've all had a physical birth. If you're watching online, you've had a physical birth. That's why we're here. But to get into my kingdom, you have to have a second birth, a spiritual birth. How do you have that birth, Jesus? Oh, you have that birth by simply putting your faith and trust in me. Now, that's the background to this phrase, love as brothers and sisters. Because if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, you've been spiritually birthed into a new family. You're part of this kingdom that is going to last forever, which means if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, I'm your brother. I thought you'd be a little more excited by that. We're family. We're family. If you're online or you're sitting in this room and you've put your faith, look around the room. Anybody who's put their faith, we're family now. We're brothers and sisters. So 250 times in the New Testament, the writers will say, hey, be unified. Live, live in harmony like your brothers and sisters. Now, I'm talking about a healthy family, not an unhealthy family. Some of you came from unhealthy families. And you're like, I don't want to live like that. But in a healthy family, brothers and sisters, oh, they may still fight at times, but at the end of the day, it's like, man, I got your back. That's a healthy family, right? We may fight, but at the end of the day, oh, I got your back like no one else does. So the second ingredient in how we live out this important concept of unity, of living in harmony, of loving each other, why is it so important? Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I pray that they would be one as we are one so that the world can, will know. And how does the world know that we're followers of Jesus? By our love. Why? Because people care more about what comes out of your life than what comes out of your mouth. And the second ingredient then is he's saying, oh, be loyal to each other. Look at the third ingredient here. The third ingredient is be compassionate. Be compassionate. And here's how he actually says it. If you keep reading in verse 8, it literally says, be tender hearted. I just changed that to compassionate because we don't really talk about being tender hearted very often anymore. We use the word compassion. But compassion is different than sympathy or empathy. It's so important for you to get, okay? Compassion moves us past sympathy or empathy because compassion compels us to do something. Compels us to do something. See, sympathy and empathy, and it's important because Peter just got done saying we need to be sympathetic, empathetic with each other. That will move me if you're grieving to maybe cry with you, but compassion is what will compel me to do something. This is, this is what you see in the life of Jesus over and over again. If you were to read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see a phrase like this said over and over again, and it'll say, and Jesus was moved with compassion, and then read the next line, because it'll say, and so he fed them. And so he healed them. He did something with his compassion. See, compassion moves us past just being empathetic or sympathetic. It moves us to do something. I'm going to come back to that at the end. But look at the fourth ingredient here. Uh, be sympathetic. Be loyal. Be compassionate. Be humble. Be humble. In fact, he says it this way. If you look at verse 8 again, he says, and keep a humble spirit. This is my definition for humility. Some of you have heard me say this before, but I, but I say this because I think humility is one of the most misunderstood things. We talk a lot about humility in our culture. But people are like, what does it really look like when someone's humble? I mean, we kind of, we can sense it, we can feel it when you're with a humble person, like you can sense and feel it when you're with an arrogant person, but how do you really define it? So here's what humility is. Humility is to understand who we are in relationship with God, who we are in relationship with each other, and to recognize our own brokenness. I'm going to say that again if you're a note taker, you can, because I know you want to write this down. So I, I'm going to say it again a couple of times. Humility is to understand who we are in relationship to God, who we are in relationship to each other, and to recognize our own brokenness. All three of those are important. So you remember what I said about the, 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 the context, the context of this whole narrative, this whole story. We're not the center of the universe. Who is? God. Humility is to understand who we are in relationship with God. In the beginning, God, not in the beginning, Patrick. At the end, everybody bows and worships God, not Patrick, not you. Humility is to understand who we are in relationship to God, to say you're God and I'm not. But humility is to also understand who we are in relationship to each other. Philippians chapter two, Paul says, you wanna know what humility looks like in someone's life? They put the needs of others in front of their own. It says that right in Philippians two. 
If, if you want to be humble, if you want to live humble, here's the best way you can do it. Put the needs of others in front of your own. My friends, can you imagine how much different our marriages would be if we lived that out? What, what if all of us as spouses began to put the need of our spouse in front of our own? What if families began to do that? What if a church like Rock Point Church began to do that? Can you imagine how revolutionary that would be? This is what I mean by this being an upside down, backwards, inside out message, countercultural, counterintuitive. Be humble. Humility is to understand who we are in relationship to God, who we are in relationship to each other, to, to, to put the needs of others in front of ourselves, and it's to recognize our own brokenness. Humility is to say, I, I don't have it together. You don't have it together. I'm not okay. You're not okay. I, I have hurts, habits, and hangups. You have hurts, habits, and hangups. I'm a, I'm a broken individual on this journey of life and just like you are. Humility is to understand who we are in relationship to God, who we are in relationship to each other, and to recognize our own brokenness. Uh, Peter says, man, if we're going to live this love out, we have to have a humble spirit. Why is that so important? Because people care more about what comes out of your life than what comes out of your mouth. Look, look at the fifth ingredient. We have be sympathetic, be loyal, be compassionate, be humble, be forgiving. Be forgiving. Here's how he says it. Now, now we're in verse 9. If you're reading along in your Bible, in verse 9 he says, don't repay evil for evil. My friends, this is maybe the most revolutionary of all of these. This is so countercultural. There's not a kingdom that has ever been on this planet. This is a kingdom about not repaying evil for evil, not getting ahead. That's not a kiss up and kick down culture. Every other kingdom that's ever been on this planet has been about that. But Jesus is saying, not my kingdom. If, if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, that's not how you're going to live. And, and you get it. You get it that all these other kingdoms are that way because that's why greatest movie ever made, Braveheart. Okay? I'm just telling you that now. If you disagree with me, you're wrong, but that's okay. We still get along because <laughs> unity is important. But Braveheart, greatest movie ever made. And there's that part in the beginning where they kill his wife, and then he takes his sword, and he goes in, and he gets revenge, and he's killing the people who killed his wife. And what are we doing as is, 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 is an audience? We're sitting there, especially us men, and we're going, Rah! Why? Because that just comes natural. That's what we do. That's what every kingdom does. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you worse. You take, you take something from me, and I'm going to take twice as much from you. That's how the kingdoms of this world work. Jesus says, not in my kingdom. They're going to know you by your love. Forgive. See, I, I, I told this story about two years ago when I was here at Rockpoint. I'll tell it again because it, it fits in, in that this is so natural for us to try to get even. So about two and a half years ago, there was a, a group that had wounded me deeply with something. And I won't go into details about what it was, but they had wounded me deeply. And, and, and I was just having a hard time with bitterness over it. And so one night, I, I, I was dreaming. You know how vivid and real dreams can be, right? So I'm dreaming that I hear a knock on my door. And I go look out the little peephole. And one of these guys that had wounded me and my family is standing out there. So I open the door. And in my dream... He starts saying some of the things that he had said before. And he steps in my house and he's poking my chest like this, saying those things to me. And so in my dream, I just went like, bam, throat punched him. And, and, he, and he went down in my dream. He's down going, ugh, ugh. and I wake up and I kid you not, this was me laying in bed. <laughs> it felt so good. and It was just a dream. See, that comes natural, doesn't it? Every other kingdom in this world, you get even. You get ahead. And Jesus is saying, not in my kingdom. How many Suns fans do we have in here? Right? Woo! Got a big game today. Man, I don't know if you know much about their coach, but I got a ton of respect for this guy, Monty. And in fact, I would, I would encourage you before the game today, and even if you aren't a Suns fan or a basketball fan, go home and Google this and watch this. Monty's eulogy to his wife. Google it. It'll come up. It's about seven minutes. It's worth your time. Because see, a couple years ago, uh, Monty's wife with, I think they have five children, they, she was driving down the road, and an impaired driver who had drugs in her system crossed over, and they had a head-on collision. And it killed his wife. And if you ever heard Monty talk about his wife, he adored his wife. And a week after she's killed by this impaired driver, Monty is standing up doing the eulogy, and there's a massive crowd, and there are well-known, powerful people sitting in this audience 
I watched it later, seven minutes of your time, but near the end of it, you'll hear him say, listen, I know many of you in here are praying for me and my family, as you should, thank you, keep doing that, but there was another family that was hurting this. He's talking about the one who took his wife's life, and he says, pray for her too. I cannot call myself a servant of Jesus if I'm not willing to forgive. No wonder 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, you know how they're gonna know you're mine? This upside down, backwards, inside out message, this countercultural, counterintuitive kingdom that says we'll forgive. Forgiven people should be forgiving people. Forgiven people should be forgiving people. Forgiven people should be forgiving people. How many of you have been forgiven? How many of us in here have been forgiven by, by, by God? Of all our sins, right? Every sin, that sin that you committed that no one else knows and you would die before you stood on the stage and told anybody that little secret sin, he, he forgave you for that one too. Every sin, every sin you ever will commit in the future, every sin Jesus took on himself. You have been forgiven a debt that you could never repay. I've been forgiven a debt that I could never repay. And Jesus is saying, if you understand how much you've been forgiven, you should be a forgiving people too. And I know it's not easy, trust me. I still wake up sometimes dreaming about throat punching people. <laughs> I know it's not easy, but when I understand how much I've been forgiven, how can I not say, God, I'm gonna let this go, and I'm giving it to you. You deal with it, I forgive him. Wow. Look at this next ingredient, this sixth ingredient, this final one. He talks about being sympathetic and being loyal and compassionate and humble and forgiving. And then he says, be wise with your words. Here's how he actually writes it in verse nine. Uh, he goes on, he says, don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. You know, 3,000 years ago, David in Psalm 141 verse three wrote, put a guard over my mouth. 3,000 years ago. David said, put a guard over my mouth. Why did he say that? Because he, he knew what his son Solomon would write in Proverbs years later. He, in Solom, Solomon in Proverbs write this, that this right here, that this has a power of life and death. This, this little thing right there, one of the most powerful weapons in this world. This, and you know that. You know the stupidity of the nursery rhyme that said, sticks and stones might break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's stupid. Because every single person in here, you remember clearly some words that have been spoken to you. They tore your heart out. And 3,000 years ago, Solomon said, this right here has the power of life and death. That's why David said, put a guard over my mouth. That's why Peter, when he's writing this and he's saying, hey, we need to live in harmony. We need to live in unity. We need to love each other. Well, how do we do that? Well, one of the ways we do that is we need to be careful with our mouth. And be careful what we say. I find it interesting that you can't graduate high school in our country without taking a speech class. Like you gotta take a basic class about how to do a speech and you know, your intro and your conclusion and how you have your main points. But maybe we should start requiring classes that say not how to speak, but how to keep this shut. <laughs> yeah, good idea, I like it. I like it. Be the quietest, quickest class ever, okay? Class, all you can do is just sit there and shut up today. But man, oh, we could use that. Why? Why? Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I pray that they would be one as we are one so that the world will know. How will the world know that we're followers of Jesus? By our love. People care more about what comes out of your life than what comes out of your mouth. Wait a second. Some of you are going, aren't you talking about what comes out of our mouth here? Isn't that the last point? Here's the paradox and the irony of that. What comes out of your life eventually comes out of your mouth, and what comes out of your mouth eventually comes out of your life. What comes out of your life eventually comes out of your mouth. What comes out of your mouth eventually comes out of your life. You can fool some people sometimes, but you're never gonna fool everyone all of the time. Eventually, eventually, what comes out of your life will come out of your mouth, and what comes out of your mouth will come out of your life. And that's why at the end, there's this sixth ingredient here, Peter's saying, okay, how do we love each other? How do we live in harmony with each other? How do we do this? Well, oh, be so careful with your mouth. Be so careful with your words. So here's my challenge. Here's my challenge for us. And I say us because I need this challenge too. I want you to look at those six, and can we put the, oh, there they are, they're on the screen again. I want you to look at those six and just between you and God ask, which one do I need to work on? 
Now, maybe I'm doing pretty well with these four or five, but, but which one do I need to work on? Sympathetic. Do I, do, do I not really feel other people's feelings? Do I not grieve with other people? Do I not celebrate with other Maybe that's the one. Is it, is it be loyal? Are, are you loyal? Do you recognize we're, we're family? I'm your brother, whether you like it or not. And, and, and even when we have disagreements, we need to come back together and say, man, I got your back. Is it be compassionate? Or maybe you have empathy, but, but all you do is sit on the couch and cry when you see those sad commercials. That didn't help the starving kid. So maybe you have to just get up and do something. Be compassionate. Be humble. Put the needs of others in front of your own. Maybe that's the one where you're saying, oh, God, I don't do this well. It's always about me. Be forgiving. Some of you are carrying around grudges and bitterness. It's killing you. Let it go. Give it to God. Be wise with your words. Some of you were born with a gift, or maybe it's a curse that you can put people down so quickly. Like they, they, give, they give a little put down to you and you come back and put them down twice as, you know, you, some people are really good at that. Like, oh, you got me, oh, let me get you. And I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, but if you have that, be very careful with it. The words can hurt. Let, let me just conclude with this story and, and I'm, I'm gonna illustrate what compassion is. It's kind of right in the middle of these six ingredients. It's the third thing that he lists. But I find it interesting because it's the one that's maybe most important. They're all important. We don't get to pick and choose, but this is the one that has us actually do something. This is the one that compels us to do something. And there's the story of the 1988 Olympics, and I, I get it. I look around this room, I go, there's a lot of you that weren't alive in 1988. So, so let me tell you the story. In 1988, there was a guy named Dan Jensen. He was an American skater from Wisconsin. He was a speed skater, one of the best in the world. And hours before he was gonna do his race in 1988 Olympics, his sister, who had been battling leukemia, who he loved dearly, died. And so the whole world is hearing this story. And when Dan Jensen went up to the starting line and he digs his skate in and he gets ready to go, the whole world had heard about his sister who had just died hours before and that Dan Jensen was, was doing this race to honor her. And he was favored to win. And the gun goes off and Dan takes off and he crashes in the first corner. Now, some of you don't remember the story, you weren't even alive, but, but here's a picture of Dan Jensen. And you, you can see in that picture the, the grief, the pain. He just lost his sister and he was gonna honor her and now he failed. In the next couple of weeks, Dan Jensen would receive thousands of letters from all over the world, people that were empathetic and sympathetic toward him. But there was a kid from the Special Olympics that moved beyond just sympathy and empathy. His name was Mark, and, and here's what he wrote in his letter to Dan. He said, Dear Dan, I watched you on TV. I'm sorry that you fell two times. I'm in the Special Olympics. I won a gold medal at Pennsylvania State Summer Olympics right after my dad died seven years ago. Before we start the games at the Special Olympics, we have a saying that goes like this. Let me win, but if I can't win, let me be brave in the attempt. I wanna share one of my gold medals with you because I don't like to see you not get one. Try again in four more years. Dan reached inside of that envelope. And there was a gold medal, Mark's gold medal. That's compassion. He, he didn't just write a letter like thousands of others and those letters were nice, sympathy, it's an important one, it's the first ingredient. He's saying, I'm gonna do something. Rock Point, can you imagine if we live these out? 2,000 years ago, Jesus said, I pray that they would be one as we are one, Father, so that the world can know. And how is the world going to know that they're mine, that they're part of a different kingdom? By their love. Why? Because people care more what comes out of our life than what comes out of our mouth. Imagine if we live these six things out. It is a church called Rock Point. If we live these things out, I can promise you that our community will start to take notice. Because Jesus said 2,000 years ago, they'll know you by your love. As we sing this last song, man, would you make the words of the song your prayer? Listen closely to the words of this song. It's everything that I just talked about. God, Jesus, thank you for your patience with us. I look at this list of six things and I think, which one do I need to work on? Well, all six. Thank you for your patience with us. But also, God, thank you for the promise that you've empowered us through your spirit with everything we need for life and godliness. You've given us everything we need to live this out. 
And so I pray that as a community of, of, of believers, as, as your followers, Jesus, that we would begin to live this out, that people would see us living in unity and harmony together, loving each other. And because of this, God, they would eventually come to know you. May we do that. May we live this. We love you, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen.
church, just like Pat was saying, may that be our prayer and our desire for this week, that we will become more and more like Jesus every day in our love to each other, in the situations we don't want to, may we take on the love of Christ and his heart because they will know that we are Christians by our love. Thank you for joining us online today. If you need prayer, connect with us on rockpoint.io under the Need to Talk tab. Be sure to follow us on social media to stay up to date with what's happening here at Rockpoint.